start the session with uh, David, who's been working for so many months and years on the music and the life of Gideon Klein, and Eva, who's been working all her life on the work of Hans Gall. So over to... God help. Yeah. My build oh. erscheint nicht, but... Hello, Stanzi. Okay. okay. Off you go. Okay. So hopefully everybody is, uh, is muted. Uh, it's great to see everyone, isn't it, Eva? It is indeed. Yeah. It's lovely. Lovely to, to meet up with folk. And uh, greetings to all of you from Leeds. Uh, for all sorts of practical reasons, which we won't go into, we decided it was easier if we were, Eva and I were sitting at the same, in the same room and around the same computer. And uh, we've, we've sort of debated over the past few days how we're going to play this. And each time that we debate it, it alters. So uh, it's, it might be largely up to, 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 to you to ask questions and to see how far we go. But um, what we're going to be talking about today is the way in which we can think about reintegrating uh, the music of, of two, in many ways, two very different composers who were affected by the Holocaust in different ways into the repertoire and back into the repertoire. Uh, in Gideon Klein's case, uh, a composer who, uh, whose work was um, lost as a result of the Holocaust and then rediscovered, and in the case of Hans Gahl, whose music was part of the canon before the war and then wasn't part of the canon and now is coming back into the canon. So that's, that's a very interesting one uh, as well. So we hope that uh, it will generate uh, a lot of interesting uh, discussion um, from, from all of you. Um, and um, we're going to introduce each other, aren't we? Yes. So many of you know either myself or Eva, uh, but um, for, for those of you who are coming across Eva for the, for the first time, um, an interesting thing, Eva, about you is that you uh, you drew it bilingually, um, and I think that this was because many Jewish refugees completely refused to speak German uh, after the Holocaust. But in your particular case, um, that 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 wasn't the case. So uh, so that's uh, that's an uh, an interesting feature, and and I guess that that was one of the, the reasons why eventually you chose to study modern languages um, in, in a sense to acquire something of your parents' European identity. Indeed, indeed. Um, my father, un unlike so many others, was simply not willing to give Hitler the power to take away his language or even his birthright. He identified very strongly with the German-speaking world and German culture, not even, I would say, narrowly Austrian. Um, he, he was born into a Vienna that was part of a much, much larger um, unit of the dual monarchy, and um, he remained very, uh, very cosmopolitan even though I know that that was used as a dirty word um, in, defaming, in defaming Jews. So he saw absolutely no reason to deny his language or his roots. And that was consistent. But um, the point is we spoke German at home and English um, in public places. That was considered more tactful, um, given that I was born um, you know, uh, just before the end of the war. And, and, and interestingly, thinking about, I'm thinking of sort of a, uh, a comparison with, uh, with Gideon Klein and his early childhood, where his uh, grandparents would have spoken, they spoke German as their first language, but his parents made this conscious decision in that post First World War period to make sure that they chose Czech, that they spoke Czech. And whenever the parents and, of course, the, grand, the grandparents um, wanted, wanted to make sure that their, 
the children wouldn't understand what they were saying, they spoke German. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and then, um, not surprisingly, you went on to become a lecturer in German and French and English literature at York University from the early 70s to 2001. In a department of English and related literature, um, which was perhaps a slightly um, colonialist um, concept with um, English literature and uh, but um, other things outside that had a connection that were that were related. Um, I in fact came into the department with a modern languages background and my particular interest was actually in integrating English, French and German literature being the, the three languages that I knew and I was also involved in um, as a founder member of the British Comparative Literature um, Association. So I was very involved with um, uh, again a, a, an approach to literature that went across um, national boundaries. But also not surprising you're a musician as well, um, uh, pianist and violinist and uh, you performed in well as a youngster, as a child, really, in a string quartet supervised by your father, and you played duets and chamber music with your father right up to his death, isn't that well, this right? This was one of the best things he did for me. I mean, he left the basic business of, of everything to do with housework to my mother and looking after me, but um, to the end of his life, if I ever said I wanted to play piano duets, he would do it and he regularly went to the library to pick up music for us to play so I, I, I discovered um, the major classics in precisely the way he had as a youngster before radio and um, uh, basically to get to know a score you, you played it as a piano duet. So he did that for me and my string quartet um, was with four people, all born in the same year as me, and um, we met on the first Sunday of every month, and the big bride really was my mother's cake. Uh, she made cheesecake and chocolate cake, and um, I think that was the major attraction. But my father would, again, get the music from the library, and um, we worked through uh, all the main Mozart quartets, the uh, Beethoven Opus 18, the middle Beethoven, um, quite a lot of Haydn, um, Dvorak, Brahms, um, a huge amount of repertoire between age 12 and 18. And he didn't interfere a lot, he just sat there with a the score and if it came a little bit unstuck, um, he got it to work again and I suppose he made sure that speeds were okay and so on but otherwise he just let us play. So this was not always coaching for um, concerts or competitions. And, and again that type of domestic music making I'm thinking about Gideon Klein's early childhood where that type of domestic music making took, took place in his family home as well. It was all important and visiting musicians who used to, uh, to, to pass through Cherov in, in Moravia always stopped by at the house and music was performed and, and so forth. So it's a, it, it's a wonderful type of tradition where you, you really start to understand the repertoire. Isn't it? it was a culture of live music making and getting to know the music from inside. And um, uh, I know in my father's case it came from um, a time when um, music was not so readily available because it was before radio, so you were dependent on um, a limited number of, um, of live concerts, but for every one of those he would prepare with uh, a score once he was able to do that and um, play duets. One sister was just one year older, one was um, six years younger. The, the third sister, who did become a professional musician, was nine years younger, so she would not have been playing duets with him at the time. But um, yes. And, and, and since then, you know, your ongoing work is with 
Hans Gahl and promoting his music and of course through the Hans Gahl Society and being involved in, in uh, co-editing some of the music and thinking of the piano reductions of some of the concertos uh, and, um, and, and helping generally to promote his music which we're, we're going to be talking about. The, um, the, the new editions of Piano Reductions, um, that has been something we tried to, I think uh, my son tried to instigate that when he was at Music College in Detmold. So we're talking 20 years ago and um, it's taken a long time to materialize, but it is happening because without um, uh, available computer set or printed piano reductions, the music is just not accessible, particularly for um, these, uh, the cello concerto, the piano concerto and the violin concerto. The violin concerto is work in progress at the moment, so that should appear next year. And this, and this, of course, is all part of what we're talking about, reintegrating the, the, the music. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. so tell me a little bit about um, what it has involved for you in a very different situation, working with Gideon Klein, where you actually had, have had to uh, unearth the music of a young man who was buried alive, in effect. In effect, yeah. Um, and uh, have had to rediscover and do the archive work, let alone then see it into print. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about the kind of work you've done? The, um, pretty much, uh, even before I started my research, uh, pretty much um, all of the pieces of music that Gideon Klein had completed uh, were published and they were they were published uh, in the 90s. Uh, some of it was overseen by his sister, Lisa Elishka, of course, she was a, a musician uh, herself. But there were some, some works which, uh, which hadn't been published. And uh, in particular, there's this rather fascinating, um, this fascinating uh, piece called um, the, the Poplar Tree Topol in, uh, in Czech uh, for narrator and piano. Uh, and that was not only in manuscript, but in, in, in a fair copy as well. Uh, and uh, I made a performing edition of it. And um, the, most, the most recent news is, well, the most recent pre-lockdown news is that uh, eventually it's going to be published by Baron Writer. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, everything stopped at the moment. So, um, you know, the, the poplar tree, the poplar tree uh, has sort of come to a, to a full stop. Um, temporarily, I would say, but nonetheless, it has been performed a number of occasions, including at a Wigmore Hall concert, which was broadcast by the BBC. So there's an example of, of finding a piece of music, uh, making a performing edition and performing and, and really having a premiere of it, a world premiere, because it was never performed in, in Gideon's own lifetime in any case. Where did he compose it? It was in Prague. And um, one of the things which I, I've been really uh, researching because it was a neglected side of any research which had so far been done about him was to try and, and, and recreate and go into detail about that, uh, that, that period immediately before he was imprisoned. How was he engaging uh, with the, in the Prague musical scene, in, within the Prague sort of um, intelligentsia, so to speak. And, and it's an absolutely fascinating story. And I would say that I've spent more time researching that than actually researching his, uh, his time in Terezin, because that's reasonably well documented. But the time when he was in uh, in Prague wasn't documented at all. And that is the context for the man who was then um, incarcerated. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, so much so that um, a lot of the sort of domestic music making which he was involved with in Prague during, during the, the early years of the German occupation, that had a direct impact 
on the music making in Terezin, uh, as we know. Um, and uh, of course, even though he was very young by the time he got to Terezin, he was in, in his early 20s, he was already known to so many people as this uh, precociously talented and, and wonderful musician who had uh, sort of set the music world of, of Prague alight in many ways. Can you say something about, I mean, did he um, have a day job as well? I mean, he was so young, he was only 20, 22. How, uh, how did he earn his key? Um, or was he a student? Well, he was a student. He was a, he, but he a probably had to work as well. Well, he was a full-time yeah. student at the, the Prague Conservatory. But he probably uh, had to work too. Well, not a great deal, I have to say, okay. because, because he was spending so much of his time studying at the conservatory, mm -hmm. but he was doing things like he was a, uh, a part-time repetiteur at the National Theatre uh, mm -hmm. in, in Prague, for example. And then during the time of the occupation, he was involved in teaching uh, Jewish kids at the Jewish Orphanage and at the Hagibor um, uh, youth, Jewish Youth Club as well. So he wasn't just involved in music, but in education in general. And of course, that had late, this later impact of when he was in Terezin, because he was not only an active musician there, but he was also a teacher as well, and uh, a teacher of, of, of the young, young people there as well. I mean, in the case of my father, he started teaching at 14. His first pupil was his youngest sister, and um, that seems to have been successful enough that a year later she was regarded as a sort of wunderkind, and the result was that both she and he then uh, were moved to the foremost, or a for, one of the foremost piano teachers in Vienna, which my father didn't have before. So he was 15 by the time he got to the teacher who um, it was very important then for him. Richard Robert, who was also the teacher of Clara Haskell and um, George Sell and um, uh, Rudolf Serkin as well. They were all pupils of Richard Robert and it was... Um, uh, but my father basically worked full time at all times. Um, I mean, he was teaching, um, uh, teaching also at the um, New Conservatoire, which, which Richard Robert was director of in Vienna, um, straight after finishing school and getting his diploma as a, as a piano teacher and taught all his life, accompanied a lot. Um, did editorial work and so a lot of these things went on at the same time as being a student but those are the various skills that he was able to draw on um, uh, in less good times when uh, all of a sudden the pianist, the um, editor and the musicologist moved into the background but, uh, sorry into the foreground mm. but they were in the background for him before he did those things in order to maintain his freedom so, as, a, as a composer. And his father would not have allowed him to go to a theatre, which is why he went to university. Um, but I think he, um, uh, he said his um, teacher of um, uh, music history, Guido Adler, um, uh, had the wonderful quality that, you know, if a student was talented, he just let him do his own thing. So that's interesting that, you know, acquiring those skills and in particular acquiring not just the compositional and pianistic skills, but the musicological skills which you touched upon, because um, th this is something which I want to mention, which I think is key to this discussion as well. And that is, uh, Eva, when, when, I was, uh, when I was a student, um, many, many moons ago, one of our set works on the reading list, we had to buy this book. I'm going to hold this up to the, to the camera because um, a, a lot of you watching this might be familiar with this, with this fantastic book. In and German, it, it, was, it, was, it was first written in English and then translated into German and then uh, called In Dur und Moll. So the musicians were letters of the great composers 
And not only is it letters of the great composers, but there's also some narrative which goes with it as well. So this was one of our um, uh, set, set works. And then other books like this, this is, uh, I remember using this, I think when I was doing my A-level music, which was, I don't know, 100 years ago or something like that. Um, and uh, again, some of you might be familiar with, with these BBC music guides that were absolutely fantastic. And, you know, the, 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 great, the greatest and the greater and the good, but the greatest uh, uh, musicologists were commissioned to, to write them. Uh, this is one on Schumann's orchestral music by Gall. But the point I'm making is this, that when, before we actually met and started to collaborate in various ways, um, I was at a, a meeting at Leeds University. In fact, it was convened by Steve Muir, who I know is, uh, is, has tuned in to this, uh, to this uh, cause. Uh, and uh, Steve, I don't know whether you remember, but um, your husband, uh, Tony, was there around the table and we introduced ourselves. And um, when he said who he was, you know, the, the son-in-law of Hans Gahl. So I said, oh, Hans Gahl, the musicologist. He said, well, Hans Gahl, the composer. This was a meeting in Leeds and um, Tony was, were, uh, was a lecturer in 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 Leeds, possibly already part time. Then, what what year would it have been? Quite uh, quite a while ago. Yeah. But in any case, that was the first meeting with these guys. And then I met David um, and Steve together. Um, they came to us uh, to us in York, um, and they were applying for a grant. Um, with a very um, ambitious research project called Performing the Jewish Archive. Um, and, in, and David and Steve were the chief instigators of this, am I right? And managed to secure, um, was it a 1.8? 1.8 million. Million pound yeah. grant from the um, uh, Humanities and Arts Research Council. Um, so that was a big deal, and that's been very, very important. And certainly that's where I first saw the fruits of, of uh, some of your work through uh, performances that were put on during that project called Out of the Shadows, of the Shadows a little, absolutely. which was really yeah. brilliant with reconstructions of work from, uh, from Terezine. And um, finally, um, another offshoot of this is, um, has just materialized in the form of a, of a CD that's recently been released um, of um, Gal's Music for Voices. This is volume one um, and it's a cappella works. And it's, um, he wrote a huge amount of choral music, which up till now, uh, has been uh, has not been actually recorded on CD. I mean, in fact, Eva, during the Out of the Shadows festival in uh, in the Czech Republic in 2016, yes. we put on a, a, a it was a, a, a most wonderful, memorable concert of Gal's choral music in the Spanish synagogue. We repeated it a few days later in the old synagogue. Um, in fact. Uh, Oh, Steve's just, Steve's just sent the link through to the CD. Uh, we re repeated the concert a few days later in the old synagogue in Pilsen, this, mm. you know, wonderfully restored uh, space, performing space. Uh, and I've put the link to that, to the Spanish synagogue concert uh, on the handout, which, uh, which has been sent around. Um, so anyway, the point I'm making, of course, is that uh, even for me as a musician, um, then in 2013, Steve said the, the, that meeting took place in 2013, I think he's right. Uh, for me as a musician, Hans Gahl was still the musicologist rather than the mm -hmm. composer. Mm -hmm. I was soon put right on that, I have to tell you. But, but it tells you something, doesn't it? You were in good company and that's very, very strongly the case it's still in Germany, I think, that he's regarded as the Musikwissenschaftler. And um, that's 
partly because he's known for his um, um, Brahms edition. He edited the uh, the um, a complete edition of Brahms music with Lysabius Mandelchevsky, who was, I suppose, the most important performative influence uh, on his life. And he had been uh, Mandelchevsky had been a good friend of Brahms in in later years in Vienna, and. Um, to my father, he was like uh, his his spiritual father and and mentor. He was um, really an incredibly important person in 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 my father's life. And the two men produced twenty six volumes of the complete edition in two years, I think. Um, in fact, I think it was the death of Mantuchevsky in 1929 that in a way um, uh, broke an important link to Vienna and at least um, opened up the possibility for him of moving when uh, a job opportunity arose to teach at the um, music college in, in Mainz. In 1929, uh, December, he he moved to Germany, mm -hmm. as did so many, so many others. But um, sorry, I'm sidetracking the mu the musicologist. Yes, I mean these were for uh, for my father secondary, but when he did it, he did it well and with great interest. What he said about writing books was that actually he never wrote a book without actually being asked to do it by a publisher. It may be that the Schubert book mm. was written himself uh, um, out of his own uh, volition, but um, the Brahms, he was persuaded to, uh, to do it and um, the Wagner book, uh, an interesting study of Wagner bringing out the ambivalence. I know it's a very fraught uh, subject, but um, um, just simply the split in, in, the character, in, in his personality. And it was not, he was not enough of a, Wagner, of a total Wagner enthusiast and apologist for the um, real Wagnerians and not anti enough for the um, anti people. Be, because basically um, he did greatly admire the music while recognising the monstrosity of the man. But the, that whole Austro-German tradition, the Viennese tradition yeah. especially, meant such a great deal to him. And I, I suppose that one of the questions is, in the post-war period, when, when he was here in, in this mm -hmm. country, um, when it was increasingly, if not impossible for him to get performances. Um, what, were the re what were the reasons for, for, the, for the music being so neglected? This is not strictly speaking true. Um, it took a few years to become known because he was totally unknown. However, between 1940 and 49, there were eight broadcasts um, on British Airways of um, an overture that I think he wrote in 1939, the Pickwickian overture. Um, eight uh, in, 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 those, in those years um, when most uh, Austrian and German composers were totally banned. And I think Gaal slipped through because he was probably seen as an opera, operatic composer and um, they weren't aware of all the other stuff he'd written. But actually, in those years, there were large numbers of performances of his own works, of arrangements, um, you know, he did all sorts just to so what, 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 So are we talking about the 1950s? No, we're talking about the 1940s. Oh, the 40s? The 40s. Right, okay. The 40s were not a bad period at all. Um, the early 50s was still um, okay-ish, 
But then we moved more and more into the avant-garde and um, uh, BBC came along with quite a bit of different uh, criteria and um, I remember um, oh, he really um, was very annoyed when he had to submit a manuscript for his overture to a puppet play which had had about a hundred performances previously. You know, suddenly you're asked to submit a manuscript um, to whether the controller of Radio 3 will accept it. Mm -hmm. So to what extent, how did, how did he feel about the notion that a composer's style should somehow adapt to meet the prevailing um, isms of the day? He um, rejected all isms for himself. Um, what he tended to say is he looked neither to the right nor to the left. He, um, that for better or for worse, fairly early on, um, he had a strong sense of his, his own, own voice as, as a composer. Um, admittedly, I mean, here we, we can talk about that, the comparison with Klein, because of course he was blessed with, with a long, long, long life. Um, but, um, and, and he did indeed um, destroy, well, discard a great deal of what he composed in the early years. But once he saw things into print, he absolutely stood by that to the end of his life um, that he had published what he wanted to that he had not published a single thing that he would have regretted and that was the one and only thing for which he was truly grateful to the first world war was that it gave him the detachment from his own early works but just one point in relation to the um, musicology again which you which you brought up i mean um the first job he was able to do as a refugee in in this country was the cataloging and ordering of the um of, of a music library the reed uh, library which at that time was um quite valuable collection of books but in boxes in complete chaos and um sir so donald tovey um he was the person who um managed to get a visa to uh, enable um hans Gall to come to edinburgh for six months in 1938 um to do that, uh, to do that work. So, as a new refugee, um, after all, they were not allowed to work in in the passport. No work, paid or unpaid. Mm -hmm. um, so there was nothing they were allowed to do. Anyway, Tovey got him uh, a six-month um, visa, and he said afterwards that all the books he ever wrote, um, uh, he he can thank those six months in the library. Now, I'm sure that's a typical Gal understatement, but, um, uh, you know, he, uh, that, that was how he put it. And particularly something like the letters of the great composers. It was because he knew um, all those, uh, those composers and their letters that, that he could do it. But he, he did a lot of reading during his work. Uh, that library I, and that continued to be like our house library. I, I remember Eva um, visiting your home when the, the, the Gal arch archive was still there yeah. and all these letters from from the great musicians mm. you know it was absolutely astonishing mm. so you know exactly as, as you were as you were saying. And he was very, very well read. So, you know, he had a genuine interest in these things. But, but it was how, I, I suppose the point is that he was able to make the most of um, an otherwise very difficult situation where you're not allowed to work, but okay, six months cataloguing a library um, in Edinburgh, great. And that, um, laid the foundations of, of a contact with Edinburgh and then when the war 
started in, in 1939 and London became very difficult with the nightly bomb sirens and so on. Um, the, the decision to move to Edinburgh, I'm sure, was partly um, influenced by those six months he'd spent there. We, t we talked before, you mentioned, Eva, that uh, Gal lived a very long life. Mm. Uh, Klein didn't. I mean, yeah. you know, Klein barely reached a quarter of a century. Um, and uh, we, we, we were talking before this, uh, this session started about this whole idea of the composer as a Holocaust survivor, or a Holocaust victim yeah. and of memorialization. And we, yes. we spent quite a bit of time talking about that. And of course, um, the, you know, the title of this session is, is Post-Holocaust Fracture. So, you know, we mustn't lose, lose sight of the fact that, um, that, that that is exactly what happened with the Holocaust. There was this sense of fracture in all sorts of ways, whether it was the fracture of a young life like Gideon Klein's destruction of a young life, or uh, a, a fracture in, in Gal's life as well? Many fractures, yeah. actually. Um, I think the First World War was an enormous fracture. Um, I mean, so many years of being removed from his work and in active service. And, um, but even then, I mean, he uh, I think he volunteered for a very remote outpost in, in the Carpathian Mountains in, uh, in Poland, um, where, they, where the, um, they had to build a railway. And um, he managed to write the bulk of his first published opera um, there. Mm -hmm. And all sorts of other works. Um, during that time. So, um, it, obviously the Nazi period um, was uh, uh, horrific. You know, one moment uh, you're at the top. Um, he was very happy in his position as director of the music college. He, he was on the committee of the um, um, music society that um, that put on annual concerts of new music with Alban Berg and Ernst Toff together on the, on the jury that selected the works and um, traveled a, a lot, immensely busy, um, composed a, a, a lot too, uh, very very busy as a, as a as a teacher, and then suddenly simply cut off and no further livelihood. Um, the return to Vienna was one of the very worst times, I think, because you come to what you think is your home and actually um, later changed beyond recognition. You could no longer get a proper professional job, had to make do with private teaching, with occasional work, with editing again. Um, uh, you know, he, as it were, he, as he put it, he wrote for his desk drawer. There was no, um, uh, no real opportunities for performance. Even though Austria was not yet under Hitler, it was already um, incredibly reduced, the performance opportunities. So that was another absolutely massive fracture. Um, there's, a, then, there's, there's a question coming yeah. from Agnes, actually. Yes. Which uh, Agnes Corey. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, where is it, Agnes? Oh, yes. Um, Agnes asks this because mm -hmm. it, it is relevant to to what you've been mm -hmm. saying, uh, but also I'm going to follow it up with another question mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Agnes said, "Did Gal discuss his Jewish heritage, even?" if secular, with his family. And as a rider to that question, this is something I remember we had this, we had a, a conversation on the train about this, mm -hmm. about whether Gal was a Holocaust, Holocaust survivor. survivor. Yes. Can you sort of wrap up those two questions? 
the you know obviously i was i was aware of his uh, of his fate if if if, if you like um, but he did not identify with any religion so he was not jewish by identity now the holocaust survivor um, this is a question that that i've been you know putting whether um you know i am uh, as it were descended mm. born into a holocaust survival um, uh, state which does have a big effect down the generations no no doubt about it he never spoke of himself in those terms we refer to us uh, to ourselves as refugees on the other hand any member of his family or my mother's that did not escape ended up in a concentration camp and um, by the way my mother's family is from Prague um, although she moved at age six to Vienna her other cousins I mean the the family lived in a big house in Prague with five um, five families I think and one of the cousins Elie Frank um, was um, Victor Ullmann's second wife, so the one who was in um, Theresien with, uh, with him. Um, so she obviously perished there and others were in concentration camps. And my um, father's immediate family, the sister who stayed behind to look after the old mother who was kind of too old to be moved at that time. Now I have to be careful what I say because <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm at about that age or older. Um, uh, she admittedly uh, was lucky enough to have an accident um, in March 42, but um, my father's sister who stayed with her and the aunt they stayed with in Weimar um, both took their own lives to avoid deportation because they knew exactly what was coming so um yes i guess holocaust survivors but um he didn't talk in in those terms i mean just just going back to the fracture the, the, the Second World War obviously was another hiatus, but actually the one in which he was amazingly productive, composed a great deal. Um, and that was some kind of salvation for him at least. Um, uh, okay, he had to wait till 1945 to get a job, um, a, a permanent position at the university, so it was a long wait really from 1933 to 1945, a hell of a long time. Um, but I think in a way um, that the 60s were particularly painful because all of a sudden the music that had been celebrated is uh, seen is regarded so patronizingly, so dismissively as academic and whatever. I mean, the whole German tradition was seen that that way. Mm. Um, we've, we've got another question. Got another question. Yes, yeah. Um, I'm going back to Alex Klein's question. Alex, your question is uh, particularly relevant. Um, Alex says, uh, unless you're a student of music, how will you help promote this hidden music to general concert goers? Um, I'm going to have a stab at answering that one first. Because Are we that, talking about Klein? Uh, well, both, both. Because that is Klein also and, the yeah, same yeah. question. Um, uh, 
obviously there's been an enormous interest in, in the Holocaust and in, in victims, but um, I'd be interested in, in your take on Klein mm. as a victim. That is an obvious mm. identity. Mm. Mm. And um, uh, also with Gal, a lot of, um, you know, uh, well, whole festivals have been uh, put on um, celebrating music, um, uh, music, um, what's the word for fiend? Music, um, I can't think of the word, um, uh, um, put, down, put down, destroyed yeah, banned, banned, by, yeah, by, yeah. Banned by the, uh, not just banned, but defamed mm -hmm. by the, uh, by, by, by the Nazis, for uh, fame to music. I, I think that, um, I think to, firstly let me answer Alex's question uh, briefly. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the ways in which uh, we did this, uh, Alex, certainly in the, in the Gideon Klein centenary events last year in the Czech Republic, um, we called the, the festival uh, Guido's Coming Home, with an exclamation mark at mm -hmm. the end of it. Uh, in other words, it begs the question, where, has, where was Gideon? Where has he been? Why is he coming home? Where is home? And so forth. And one of the ways that we did that was, um, was to, to take Gideon Klein and his music out of the ghetto, which isn't to downplay the awful things that happened in Terezin on the one hand, or even to downplay the astonishing flowering of creativity that happened in the camp on the other hand, but nonetheless to place uh, Klein uh, in, a, in a more nuanced setting as part of a Czech tradition, as part of the European modernist tradition and so forth. And one of the things we did uh, and we made a, a decision on this, was to ensure that pretty much almost without exception, well, firstly, without exception, all the performers of the music during the festival, and these were events which ran from July of last year through to February of this year, culminating in a big birthday bash for, for Gideon in December. But all the musicians were, were Czech, um, I think we used uh, an Austrian jazz clarinetist on one occasion, but we were all Czech. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ensured that we were promoting young performers as well. So we commissioned new music by, by young composers and we, we got young people, to, young professional musicians to perform the music. So that's one way in, in taking this sort of hidden music, as you, Alex, describe it, and getting it out there. Now, the other issue is one of uh, memorialization, isn't it? You know, and um, this is an interesting one because, of course, memorialization does play its part in whenever we're talking about composers like Gideon Klein. And, um, you know, he identified in many ways quite strongly uh, as a Jew. And one of the things which, which I do as part of memorialization, as well as maybe having his music performed at, for example, Yom Hashar Holocaust Memorial events, uh, is, to, is, is to memorialize him in other ways. But I think that that is only part of the story because, again, we have to place him in that tradition of, of modern music of that period as well. And memorialization has its, has its place, but so does that more nuanced approach of placing him within the repertoire and bringing his music back within the ma mainstream repertoire. Yeah, um, in the case of Gal, um, you, you refer to hidden, hidden music. Um, I think that's all a question of the accessibility and availability of the sheet music. Gal wrote a vast amount, um, as well as living a very long life, um, which in a way for the reception can have its own problems if, if um, someone is so consistent to his own 
voice um, and doesn't necessarily see why he should change his, his style. But what he did most certainly do was respond to um, the specific requirements of each genre he worked with and every instrument and he composed a vast amount. So if you're a clarinetist there's wonderful chamber music and um, uh, you know each ensemble there's clarinet uh, violin cello, there's clarinet piano violin, uh, there's a sonata, there's a clarinet quintet. This sort of one of uh, one of each, he tended not to repeat himself, but each one was a different challenge. But at the same time, for someone who's looking for music for clarinet, um, they ought to be able to find Gal. He wrote wonderful chamber music for viola. Um, again, a huge variety and a very wonderful um, re recent CD from, from Finland on the Toccata label. And uh, the same works um, have also been, been recorded in, in America. For cello, um, for piano, for orchestra, um, uh, concertos, concertinos, only, only one of each, but the key thing is for it to be actually for the music to be um, uh, viable. Um, the publishers need to um, make it available and, and not make it higher only, which is the case with a work for string orchestra, which, which um, should not be expensive. Or, or a violin concertina with string orchestra. So um, there is a huge ongoing amount of work um, that my whole family is involved with, with um, actually trying to make this music accessible for people to play because that's what it's all about. Um, there should not be anything hidden about any of this published music and the published opuses go, go to 110. Right. Yeah, and some of them are multiple uh, works. For instance, the duos, there's a duo for cello and bassoon, one for cello and violin, and one for um, uh, violin and viola. We've got a comment from Steve Muir here, yeah. which yeah. I'm going to read out, um, because you're further away from the screen. From I can't see it. No, no. <laughs> Uh, Steve says, uh, for me, the ultimate goal is that we no longer need to have concerts, CDs, etc., of Holocaust music, but that these composers are part of the canon, whatever that is. That doesn't mean that the Holocaust context is forgotten or hidden, but that it's part of an important part of a context. But that will take time, I think. And, uh, you know, that is a thing. And um, uh, again, th there's, there's quite a few um comments on that i'm just going to read this one out this is from uh, michael shapiro mm -hmm. um hans Gahl's situation reminds me of so many american composers of his generation and later whose music has largely fallen into obscurity despite recordings and publications i think of piston persichetti Siegmeister, menin schumann diamond and several others the dreadful influence of the 60s composers on, on academic viewpoints towards contemporary music, you were touching on that, only 12-tone music's airs were thought valid, mm -hmm. stifled so many voices unnecessary. Gal's obscurity is similar to these American composers. There is also a resistance by US orchestras to playing any of their music, and certainly not Gal. One mm -hmm. way people are coping with this is publishing everything online as PDF. Will all of the Gal works be available uh, as, as PDFs? I, I know that was a, that was a, that was a, a, a long epistle from Michael Shapiro, but but absolutely relevant. That's why I wanted to to read it out. Can I answer that? Um, since the bulk of it is since it's published, it is the publishers who have the copyright. They have to decide um, in what way to make it to make it available. It's, it's not in our hands 
to do it unless unless we um, uh, we self publish and one of the major um, fractures in my father's life because of the um, geographical and political and historical dislocations of his life is that he had far too many different publishers um, uh, you know others couldn't get publishers he had uh, he had um, too, uh, too many and in the end you know each one might be waiting for someone else to do uh, to do something you know, one one of the other problems is that um, certainly I, I found writing about Klein uh, is that the uh, amount of royalties that you have to pay publishers in order just to reproduce a small segment from a piece of music is absolutely astronomical. And I was recently commissioned to write a, a journal article. Um, and uh, when we went to Boozy and Hawks to seek permission for some extracts from, from the music, it ran into hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And that, of course, impedes the dissemination uh, of the music as well. That, uh, that as well. But, I mean, it is bizarre. Um, a search on Amazon for Hans Gahl yielded do you mean hand gel? <laughs> so yeah. that's that's where we are. Um, so not quite a household name yet. Um, a, a, a message from uh, back from Michael Shapiro. He says, "I would advise getting the copyrights back if they don't get the works out. Publishers mm -hmm. are obligated to do so. They can." Um, cover themselves by it being um, notionally available, but at a crazy price. I mean, believe me, I have tried to get things back and we probably need to do more of this, but there's a huge amount of work to be done. And even where the publishers uh, like Boosie and Hawks in Berlin are absolutely committed to um, the works of, of Hans Gall. Um, they are somehow operating on with too few people, with too much to do, and it, it still takes forever. Can I just, again, because you can't read the screen, can I just read a lovely message out? Yes. This is from uh, Craig Shepherd. Uh, oh. Craig, you've got a, a connection to Leeds, of course, um, who says, um, this is lovely, uh, Eva, your father's biography on Brahms influenced me greatly as a young man. It was so full of love and generosity of spirit. I happened to mention this one day to Clifford Curzon, one of my heroes is Curzon, with whom I was working, and he said, I know Hans Gahl, and gave me his address in Edinburgh, whereupon, whereupon I had the loveliest note back from your father. I should have jumped immediately on the train at King's Cross and gone up to see him because he passed not long thereafter. Mm. I've been playing yeah. for years with Seattle's Music of Remembrance, founded by Minna Miller. And this coming season, we will be giving a performance of your father's unpublished piano trio. So looking forward to this warmest greetings from Seattle, Craig Shepherd. Isn't that lovely? Right. Thank um, you. Unpublished, I think, um, do you mean Opus 49B, which, um, I don't think there's an unpublished piano trio, but there is one that was with um, uh, an Austrian publisher, Österreichische Bundesverlag, which we took back, and that is one that we do make available for people who ask for it. So, um, and, and so it's, it is a published work, Opus 49, B, um, and I'm delighted you're playing playing it and look forward to hearing more about it. Uh, I, th I think we've, we've sort of reached that stage where, where people are putting questions in and, and, co and, and comments, uh, which is great. Um, Agnes Corrie uh, says, I would, still, I would still love to get to the bottom of Gal's Hungarian surname. 
Well, um, uh, yes, uh, the, the family is Hungarian. Um, his, his father and grand and both grandfathers, I think, maternal and, and paternal, all came to Vienna um, to study medicine. They were from Chopron, and at the time there wasn't a medical school there. So that was how, um, uh, so my father's father came to Vienna, but also his, his grandfather. But my father was actually born in Vienna. Um, there are very, very few actually Viennese born uh, composers. Schubert is one of them, but Hans Gahl is another. So, um, sorry, so you wanted to get to the bottom of, of his hung Hungarian uh, identity. Um, sorry, Agnes, but he didn't really speak Hungarian. I mean, they visited the Hungarian relatives in Chopron and, and always got unbelievable amounts of food uh, for their elevenses and so on. That's, I remember that about the family and I now have a Hungarian daughter-in-law which I'm sure he'd be very happy about who has also been immensely committed to his work. So we keep up the Hungarian co connection um, uh, but uh, Sorry, he didn't, he didn't really speak the language, uh, but his father uh, retained a Hungarian accent. Um, can I just mention something about uh, the printed editions of Klein's music? Yes. Um, I mean, there are still one or two which, which hopefully will, will be in print before long, which are not yet in print, uh, and I'll be overseeing the, the preparation for that. Um, but um, I th because Klein's music is being performed more, and certainly the pre in music as well, uh, I think that we're coming to that time where we need a critical, and sort of a new critical uh, mm -hmm. edition of, of the music as well. Uh, and I think that what we've got so far has served its purpose tremendously, mm -hmm. tre tremendously well. Can but, you but initiate that as a chief editor? No, no. No, Why not? no, no, I, I can't. I'll talk to you afterwards about that. I don't want to get, get in, into, it, okay. into it here. But uh, I put that out there in case anybody wants to take on the, on the, on the task. I mean, I've got no, no influence in this whatsoever, but all I'm saying is that, that I think that the time is, is right that we should have a, a, you know, a really fine critical edition uh, of, uh, of, of, Klein's, of Klein's work. Uh, I, I'm looking. I'm looking at other comments and questions. There's one. Um, um, thank you, Alex Klein, for your for your lovely words there. Steve Muir says, uh, "I've guesstimated that Gal composed well over 200 choral pieces. Some of them grouped into sets, of course, along with several substantial cantatas for orchestra and choir." I want to record them all ultimately, and I, I'm in, immensely grateful to the Gal family for their very fine self-published editions of some of the unpublished works, as well as for perusal copies of music from their archival collections. But it's challenging to get hold of some of it. It is indeed, and that is the major obstacle. I, I don't think there's a greater obstacle, but even the music that um, uh, my father did get published by um, Schauer, who at, at that time were the um, London branch of, of, of Zimrock, of the Zimrock edition, they took that over. Um, those editions that were published in the 70s included a lot of his um, much, much earlier chamber music, you know, going back to the war years, that was at that point he, um, he, he probably paid largely um, uh, for Shower to do, to do this, but the editions are all based on um, copyists, um, 
handwriting, copyists, fair, fair copies, and it's not the same as printed music. And um, unfortunately, it is an obstacle for, for musicians, and that is true actually of most of the chamber music that was published in the 60s and 70s. So um, on the one hand, he was able to publish what he, uh, what he chose to, um, but on the other hand, um, uh, the publishers didn't put the money into it to make decent editions. Now, these um, Bradkopf and Hertel new editions of the concertos, cello, piano and violin, are in fact critical editions. Um, uh, my husband, computer, set it. We um, have in, in, in those cases um, my father's sketch and um, uh, various bits of, of manuscript there that have all been carefully um, correlated and th those editions are being done with enormous care. We've got um, a question coming from Geraldine. Oh, a comment from Michael who's put in a, uh, a link of, of his online exhibition of, of Gal. That's there. That, that was very, very important. I mean, one thing we have not mentioned are the kind of milestones in um, trying to get over the Holocaust fracture, um, which is very, very real. Um, uh, the first, uh, first of all, a number of Orgal CDs, really from 2003, onwards. Um, the, the piano duos, the um, complete works for solo piano in 2005, um, the first recording of, of one of the symphonies and then the complete symphonies, the complete string quartets um, and, and so on. These have been, and the solo concertos have been very important milestones. Um, and this is all in the 2000s. I mean, the Hans Gahl Society was founded in 2005. So we're really talking from 2003 onwards um, and far more from 2009, 10, 11. But it's really taken till the 21st, um, till the 21st century for this to happen. Um, Another um, very important milestone was indeed an exhibition in Vienna in 2004 um, of Hans Gahl and Egon Velez, where Michael did a whole series of wonderful exhibitions on, on, on composers. Um, and, and so on, you know, there's this work on many different fronts, but um, these were terribly important milestones. Geraldine asks, um, can you tell us more about what Klein wrote in the years before incarceration? Uh, again, the, the issue being, Geraldine, is that uh, I would say most of the music that we are performing, that gets regularly performed by Klein, is the music that he wrote in Terezin. For, I think for obvious reasons, and that will continue to be the case. So I'm thinking of works like the, the String Trio and the, uh, and the Piano Sonata and the, that lovely uh, motet, uh, Bach, Aureli, Antissa uh, and the Lullaby and so forth. But the works that he wrote before incarceration and let's say in that period, in the early period of the German occupation um, and just prior to that, were, were absolutely fascinating. I mean, we've got, we've got a, a, a huge string quartet, the string quartet um, Opus 2. Incidentally, Opus numbers in Klein's works are more or less meaningless. So um, the Opus numbers don't necessarily mean a great deal. But the, the, this three movement uh, string quartet, a, a, a very substantial work, uh, the Opus 1, songs, three songs for voice and piano, the, um, the uh, 
the, 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 the divertimento for eight wind instruments, the duo for violin and viola in the, the quarter tone style, the, which is un, unfinished, but nonetheless performable. Uh, and similarly, the duo for, uh, for violin and cello, which is, is incomplete. And you can see on the actual manuscript where he put his pen down at the point when he was uh, transported to Terezin. It's the last music that he wrote in Prague uh, and the four movements for string quartet. So a whole raft of music, most of which, not all of it, but most of which we performed in the, the Gideon Klein centenary concerts uh, last year and in the early part of this year in the Czech Republic. So uh, I've certainly been doing my bit to make sure that that music is, is getting out there and is being put into the hands of young performers uh, as well. Um, Geraldine says, um, Steve Muir, a cheeky question for David. Well, Steve, you're cheeky, what can I say? Um, when do you think your excellent biography of Gideon Klein will appear in English? Steve, that is the, the, the multi-million dollar question at the moment. Uh, as you know, it is out in, in Czech now. Um, and it's a beautiful publication from uh, P uh, P3K Publishing uh, in Prague, who, who've done a wonderful job. The English version is going to be out by Takata Press, uh, Martin Anderson's uh, publishing house. Um, Martin assures me by the end of this year, and um, if anybody can put any additional pressure on Martin, in addition to what, what I'm doing, then, then please do. But things have obviously been delayed due to the uh, COVID business, obviously. Uh, but even so, I'd love to think that the, the publication would be out by the end of the year. Thanks, Steve. Noted. Any, have we, oh, Alex, um, Alex Knapp. Uh, he says, may I ask a question about musical style? I regret not knowing more of the repertoire of Klein and Gall, respectively. So can their musical idioms be compared and contrasted? Did they have similar influences or different ones? And whom did they influence? Um, if I can take the first shot at that. Um, the answer, Alex, uh, is no. Um, that their, their style is, is quite different. Uh, Klein was uh, writing, Klein was very much influenced by um, the, the second Viennese school, uh, in particular Schoenberg, uh, although he wasn't a slave to serialism uh, in the least. And all his music, I would say, all his music is, is tonal, but within certain parameters. And uh, of course, by the Czech tradition as well, by Janicek uh, in particular. And uh, on one of the uh, sketches of one of his manuscripts, I think it's the String Quartet Opus 2 is written on, on one of the pages uh, in Czech, of course. Uh, long live Schoenberg and long live Janicek with an exclamation mark. And I think that that uh, tells us about that. Uh, with Gal, that is not the case either. Yeah, it's not, it's not so easy to, um, to pin it, pin it down. Um, uh, his, his musical style is deeply rooted in the, um, what we would call the Austro-German uh, tradition, but it draws on very, very many aspects of, of that. Um, uh, and there is a very strong classical element in, in the sense that he very much stressed um, form and a degree of objectivity. He didn't believe in music just um, expressing the emotion of the moment. But at the same time, as I said before, it's strongly instrument specific, genre specific, um, and, and one genre that I haven't mentioned, which was absolutely uh, central to 
his work at the time when his um, when his reputation uh, was really um, uh, at its highest is his operas, and uh, again they they are dramatic works where where the text and and the uh, subject matter and the situation and the psychology of the of, of the characters involved all play a part in the musical language so if you like his his language is always recognizably him but he uses it differently as one would expect um, in, in, in different situations. I chickened out of saying exactly what it's like. Um, Bach is a formative in influence but then a contrapuntal texture is central to German music um, anyway. Um, uh, the melody is important. Um, there's a combination of emotional intensity and emotional restraint. Um, it, there is very much an element of extended tonality, uh, the 20th century. I mean, in an opera like Das Lied uh, der Nacht, his third uh, opera, which is the one that is now available on CD. And I think um, a wonderful uh, um, a gal performance to have on 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 the CD. Um, that is probably, if you like, the most romantic of of his works. But um, form and something that one would think of more as classical are always uh, the key. So and 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 the harmonic language is is um, is logical but quirky so you can't necessarily an anticipate exactly what's uh, what's what's coming so I don't know whether that makes any sense or answers your, your question I think you have to listen to the music really there's a follow-up comment from Michael yeah. Uh, yeah. Michael says uh, I tend to see Klein Klein growing out of Alban Berg rather more than Schoenberg. Of course, if we listen to the opening of Klein's piano sonata, most certainly. And Gal is often to my ears a 20th century Mendelssohn. I like that. I like that. Um, uh, that, that makes very good sense to me. And it's, it's a classicism that needs to be, um, that, is, that is quite uh, subtle. Uh, it's not a neoclassicism, but yeah, M Mendelssohn um, is a good, good parallel. Um, I, I'm mindful of the time. I'm just wondering if there are any other questions, or if people have put comments or questions, which which I've uh, you'll gather I'm multitasking, talking to you, and well, looking I, I at the messages at the same same time. <laughs> um, Steve says. Um, I found performing his music, Gal's music, an absolute revelation and the professional singers I work with in the choir that is recording him, and then there's a link, have been overwhelmed by it. His classicism feel intensely modern at times. Mm. Thank you, Steve, that's beautifully put. So, um, Geraldine, where where are we? I think we've uh, we've exhausted the the questions and the comments, and it, um, it's head, it's heading towards six thirty. Um, it's really been fascinating and very interesting. Is there somebody who'd like to put their hand up and say anything? Um, because at this moment, you know, you're welcome to do that, and um, we can hear you express your own question. What I mentioned on the chat was that in 2001 at the South Bank uh, with Michael, the Jewish Music Institute put on a major <clears throat> one whole day of music in this area. We called it Thwarted Voices. 
Um, and in 2002, we put on a series of two concerts at the Wigmore Hall, which included, I'm sure, Gal and Klein, and which preceded the exhibitions in Vienna because Karl Weinberger from the, the curator of the um, uh, Jewish Museum in Vienna came to, we did a conference as well as uh, these two concerts. He came and he got the idea from there to take Michael to Vienna to curate these uh, wonderful exhibitions. So as you say, Eva, there were these stepping stones mm -hmm. and each step uh, helped the other step. So we hope that today's talking to a new group of people, maybe people who are not so familiar with the music of, of either Gideon Klein or Hans Gull, um, could um, now participate in this. And maybe there are people who have ensembles and who want this. And I think we should find a way of producing music, anything that somebody's not got a hold of, you do it, just do it and make it available and let somebody challenge you. Because as, as we say, the main thing is to get the music out there. So has anybody got their hand up to say something? Um, um, maybe, um, Steve, if you're there, you could say something yourself. Uh, Michael's got your hand. Michael, please unmute yourself. Well, I'll unmute you. Hi, it's Steve here. I, I'll, I'll jump okay, in before Steve. Michael. Sorry. Um, yeah. my daughter's making dinner, so I better go soon. <laughs> um, firstly, thank you for organizing these talks. This is actually the first one I've been able to attend, but um, it's very close to my heart, of course, but um, it's been fantastic. Thank you, David and Eva. It's been great to hear you chatting. Um, great to hear your voices as well, basically after such quite a long time. Um, uh, and it's been, I'll say something personally first and then something about uh, what we've talked about today. Um, it's been a pretty horrible few years two three years for me uh, for various reasons um i won't go into but the um the initiative that's that you you uh, geraldine and martha and uh, mark and everyone else has um initiated uh has really kind of sparked sparked me back to life and i'm really grateful uh uh so I'm, I'm still not quite there, but I'm getting there. Um, and um, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that um, both these composers, I, I don't actually think they're as different as, as they f appear because they're both within a tradition. Yes, one is the first Viennese school and one is the second Viennese school, but I, you know, I detect a really strong sense of grounding in, in Klein um, uh, in that, that classical tradition. And as for Gaal, I mean, the, the counterpoint is, is miraculous uh, and yet incredibly expressive as well. One, one might look at it on the paper. Uh, it's definitely music that must be heard and not seen, um, unlike naughty children who should be seen and not heard. Um, but it's, um, it looks, it can look pretty dry on the page to the uninitiated. But, and even then when you play it on the piano, it can think, you can think, mm, it's all right. But then sing it or play it with, perform it with the instruments for which it's intended. And it, it's just totally different. It's, I can't, I can't express how exciting it is to sing that music. Uh, and the, as I said, my singers in the choir, who are some of them quite sort of cynical old professionals, <laughs> have um, have said the same thing. So, um, and and I'd say the same with uh, uh, Klein from a different, completely different perspective. Uh, but what it looks like on the page is totally um, different to the sort of liveliness that it brings. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Steve. It's lovely to hear you and to, to have you with us. I hope you'll come to many of these talks and it's 
fantastic project that you're doing with Hans Gull's Choral Works. I'm sure that they very much appreciate it. Uh, do you want to respond or should we let Michael talk? Um, Michael? Yeah, okay, fine. I yeah. wanted to just mention that uh, at, uh, we have Hans Gull's musical estate now safely lodged in Vienna and uh, and we all have digital copies of it that can be disseminated where appropriate and and allowing consent and all the rest of it. But on another subject, um, one of the composers that we're also dealing with in Vienna adds enormous context to the research and the music of of, um, of Gideon Klein. And this is the this is the composer who was also in Tiarazine, but who actually survived, named Hans Winterberg. And, I think I mentioned earlier in, in the chat that when we were researching Hans Winterberg, we found his student attendance um, a record at the Czech Conservatory in Prague. And when he was studying with Alois Haber, we saw that uh, one of Hans Winterberg's co-students with Haber was, was, um, was Gideon Klein. And we have the um, list of students in the course all as a as a document as a as a scan of the document which of course i can i can let you have if you don't have this already david but it's an interesting thing because the situation that that hans uh winterberg found himself in is very very similar it's a uh, it strengthens this whole idea for i mean for those who don't know alois haber was a very strong czech nationalist you think of him as a fractional composer a composer of fracture of fractured tones but um, he was, in fact, uh, above all, a very, very strong Czech nationalist. And, and the idea of promoting a kind of Czech school, the only survivor of which seems to be Martinu, but now with Hans Winterberg, we have another one. Um, you can begin to draw a certain line that really does emanate from, from Janacek. And when you hear that in the context of, uh, of Klein's music, there is as much, there really is as much Jana Czech as there is Second Viennese School. I, I, I am inclined now that I know so much more about this entire situation, the fact that you had to declare in 1930 whether you were a German speaking Czech or a Czech speaking Czech, and the consequences of declaring yourself as a German speaking Czech would mean deportation in 1945, and the whole complex question of nationality and identity as well. This is also something that I think is very important in, this, in the question of Hans Skal. We come back to Hans Skal. Another thing that uh, Eva mentioned about the strong sense of cultural identity to German as a language and as a cultural identity, not necessarily to Austria. But what I find fascinating is another composer, say for example, uh, Karl Rathaus, who was born in Ternopol, had a very strong Austrian identity and not necessarily a German identity. So this clash of who is, an, what's, what sort of identity is what and where do these people come from and how do you actually classify them? It's, it's a very, very complex problem because, you know, um, Karl Rathaus felt himself to be an Austrian, not a German, but an Austrian. And, um, and then all of a sudden this identity was removed from him in 1938 and Ternopol had after 1918 become part of Poland. And so by default, he suddenly found himself Polish despite the fact that his first language was German. So it's, um, or at least German bilingual, German Polish. So it's an, it's an interesting thing to contrast German Austrian composers such as Franz Schreker who also felt very strong his German identity, cultural identity, and contrast that often with those composers who were born in what's called Großösterreich, in other words, the Austria before 1918, these cultural traditions have, have created an incredibly pluralistic um, tapestry of musical idioms, and of, of which obviously the music coming out of the what is today Bohemia, Moravia, is just one, but also a very significant one. And I think that by having murdered an entire generation of Czech composers, the only one who sort of survived was Martinu. And so much of his music is now considered even American. 
They're referred to as symphonies as American, yet you listen to them and you think now in the context of this is music that is definitely coming out of Janacek and, and the whole style, this bridge that went from Prague to Paris as opposed to Prague to Berlin or Prague to Vienna. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating um, thing that has added enormous context, I think, even to the music, of, uh, understanding the music and where Gideon Klein was coming from and, and the music of Klein as well. Just to add to that, um, I mean, my father uh, certainly um, retained his Austrian identity in the sense of, of Vienna being his his home. I think it always depended in what context he was speaking. You know, when he was asked about um, his relationship to British composers, he said, "Bin halt immer ein Wiener geblieben." You know, I, I was always really Viennese um, at at heart. So, it, as I say, it, de it depends on 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 the context a bit. I think I think it was it was definitely definitely he was in good company. I mean, there were, uh, I think, most of the composers living and working and, 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 and being creative and active in, who were from Vienna, whether it was Ernst Toch or whether it was Hans Gall or, or Alban Berg, had a very strong identity as part of German culture. And, and because of the plurality of cultures and religions in Austria pre-1918, there was no sense of Austrian identity particularly. Um, but it was interesting that those composers who did come from the far furthest flung corners of the empire, who did not see themselves as German-Austrian, did see themselves as Austrian, and, and actually passionately so. And that was, uh, and uh, though uh, if you listen to the music of Karl Rathaus, you can't necessarily say it's in that strict tradition of, of Brahms and 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 Beethoven and and uh, you know the the whole the line that goes from the um, Altdeutsche Schule starting with Mendelssohn onwards. Mm. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Michael. Anybody else want to add something to the conversation? Um, <laughs> Deborah, <laughs> you have to unmute. I have to unmute you. Hi, Geraldine. Hi. Hi. Yes, it's Michael, not Deborah, as you can see. So, <laughs> a very astute Deborah. Um, it's I've got uh, just a question for Eva. Um, when you were talking earlier, Eva, about your dad playing the um, piano scores and getting to know the music from the inside. And um, Eva taught me um, some German poetry when I was at uni in York. And it reminded me of your approach, the way we did the poems. I think that's why I got such a lot out of it. Was that, is that, was that a deliberate thing or is that just a coincidence? But it felt like we were sort of mining the poems. We did some Goethe, Hölderlin and Novalis. And it felt like we were sort of mining the, the poems from kind of within. So it was a very different approach to any other you know, ways that we've done poetry. So. I just, when you said that, I thought um, it summed up exactly how it felt to me at the time. So was that a deliberate thing or is that unconscious, do you think? Or... Great, great to see you, um, Michael. <laughs> um, no, I think it was um, very much part of what brought me into literature. I think in a way, um, music is primary for me, um, but my approach to literature involved very much working from the language rather than just translating the literature into content. And um, <clears throat> that is more akin to, to music, I think, where you don't mm. have content in the same sense. I, I don't know whether um, that adds anything anything sensible, but but for me there there is I I think a continuity in um, in my approach to literature and 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 to teaching it and what what was important 
and uh, were almost trying to discover in, in a poem that held it together, formed some sort of thread that, uh, that, ran, uh, that ran through. So it was very much based on the, on the aesthetic, which are all things that uh, literature can have in common with, uh, with, with music. It's always interesting as well that it was the lyric poetry, you know, with that strongly musical element as well. So, but, um, yep. yeah, and good it, to see you, Eva. So. Yeah, it's so it, it's lovely to hear that. Um, it, it was it was very special to um, be the only person at the university teaching German literature, and therefore to be able to do what I liked, um, <laughs> which for me meant working with the greatest literature. And, and uh, what was really, really great within the German uh, tradition, which uh, one of those greats is the lyric poetry. Mm. Well, it stayed with me, definitely. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Anybody else? Um, Megan, did you have your hand up? Um, I can't see everybody at the same time. So just shout if you want to say something. Um, I think this has been a really interesting conversation where we've not had any um, um, papers in front of us or music to listen to. We've just been able to engage with what you've said to us and how you are interacting with each other, Eva and David, and how the subject is bounced off one against the other, not against the other, with the other which um, has really uh, been very, very nice. So, you know, I want to thank you both for coming in with the subject and for taking the trouble to get together in a bubble and to talk to us in this, in this way. And if I may, perhaps I'll tell you about what's happening next week. Uh, these conversations are so extraordinary and what's wonderful is to see people coming week after week when the subjects are so completely different and next week we've got um mimi schaefer and um um pianist ofra yitzhaki um mimi and ofra are both from um israel but Mimi is the cantor or was recently at the Oranienberger Synagogue in Berlin. And Ofra is a doctorate from Juilliard and a member of the faculty of Tel Aviv University. And they're going to talk about the dialogue between Jewish liturgy and classical music. So I think this is something that has concerned us for a while. Uh, COS 10 will be Rachel Adelstein with Daniel Padley talking about Anglo-Jewish song communities, singing communities. Uh, on the 1st of September, Mark will be talking with Samuel Adler, the great American composer. And on the, the, the following week, Jerry Glantz is talking about his major project using his music, his father, Leib Glantz's music, and setting it to orchestral suites and to the, the words of Elie Wiesel on his night march um, to Belsen. So that's an extraordinary thing which we witnessed uh, a performance of in Hanover uh, in January for Holocaust Memorial Day when 3,000 people were in the Kupol Sol in Hanover. And if I can mention one more, uh, you know, we have sessions booked almost to the end of the year. I think we've got 22nd of September maybe still up for grabs. Um, Mark will be talking to Joel Rubin in October about his new book about Naftali Brandwein. Um, and Josh Horowitz will be there as well. In October, Martha will be talking to Herve Rotten. And Herve has the most amazing resources available in Jewish music, 
on the website of the Paris Center for Jewish Music, and they will go through this with us and show us how we can use that. Uh, Alex Knapp and Charles Heller will be talking about the death of Nusach and Hazanut to challenge us. And so it's on every time I send an email to you about what's going on next week, there is always the tale of everything that's going on till the end of the year. So you can always follow and see what's going on. We do encourage you to join our group on Humanities Commons. It's not so difficult to join and then you'll certainly get to know things. It's quite clunky, but we're trying to work our way around that. And I'm also interested to have a show of hands from those who are still here, whether if we advertise what we're doing on Facebook, that would help you to connect with what we're doing. So you could just um, put your hand up if, you, if that would be a good thing for you. And um, so I can see Michael Shapiro has got his hand up. Mark's got his hand up. Um, uh, Deborah, <laughs> Deborah Stroke Michael's got his hand up, etc. Uh, it seems to me that as Tanya Fox put it, we may have our grape gripes, but not to have Facebook is like cutting off our nose to spite our face when it's really helpful to us to disseminate um, information of what we're doing. So maybe that's enough for me, but I'm happy still if anybody wants to come in with the last word. Um, just shout because I can't see where you are. Um, otherwise, I'm going to thank David and Eva again on behalf of all of us for their lovely talk. Um, and um, David, I think you're doing another one later on in the year, aren't you? That you've been hook to do another one. I've been, I've been press ganged by Agnes in December. Right. So Agnes and David will be doing something on something Hungarian. I'm not quite sure what it's going to be yet. I don't know if they are, but that will be great. And thank you to Michael, especially as Michael's going to write a little report of this. What we like to do is have a report, which we then file on our website and you can tune in and, uh, um, download the recording so if you want to hear anything again that you didn't hear before that's all there and thank you to Laurie and to Mark and to Martha who might have gone to keep this little project running and um, thank you to all of you who joined in and thank you and thank you thank Geraldine you for making it all happen absolutely thank you Okay. It's, my, it's my pleasure, you know, to see it, to see everybody, as I, I like to say, I like to make the platforms and then to see people come and dance on them. <laughs> so, here we are. And thank you for dancing. Thank you. So, until next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Geraldine, thank you. This is truly, truly wonderful. <laughs> it's lovely, and it's nice to see you sitting in the sunshine. Are you outside? Are you actually outside, or is that? No, a this is the front of my house, um, and uh, <laughs> I just use it as a background. <laughs> but, uh, it's, power, but yeah, <laughs> it's, lo it's lovely. Yeah. So, thank you all, and thank you, Mark, for everything. Oh, and, sure. Anything we want to say before? Uh, no, I think we're I think we're, we're we're doing very good. I look forward to our planning meeting on Monday. Okay, okay. great. Okay, bye. bye. Shall we close then? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll end the meeting now, and I think that will end the recording. So thank you.